How I wish that you had invited me to that most glorious banquet on the Ides of March, said Marcus Tullius Cicero in a 43 BC letter written to Gaius Trebonius. As the very man who had detained Marcus Antonius just prior to Caesar's assassination, preventing him from entering the Curia and separating the dictator from his protector, Trebonius had taken no part in the actual killing of Caesar. Yet, as a member of the plot to assassinate the father of the nation, Pontifex Maximus, and dictator for life, Gaius Trebonius found it prudent to quickly vacate Rome and take up his proconsulship of Asia in the wake of Caesar's maniacal funeral. Having no knowledge of the plan to kill Rome's head of state, Cicero was among those senators who sat dumbfounded for the approximately forty-five seconds it took for the conspirators to strike Caesar down. After delivering his humiliating blow to Caesar's genitals, Marcus Junius Brutus had turned, his bloody dagger raised in the air, and then personally charged Marcus Tullius Cicero to restore the Republic. By evening, however, the removal of Rome's tyrant had gone horribly wrong. Brutus, Cassius, Trebonius, Decimus Brutus, and the rest of Caesar's assassins had barricaded themselves like cowards high atop Capitoline Hill. The Roman people, who were supposed to fall on their knees and thank the liberators for freeing them, had instead rushed to their homes, hiding behind locked doors. Marcus Aemilius Lepidus had moved a full legion of veterans onto the campus marshes, and through the instrumentality of Calpurnia, Marcus Antonius had laid hold of all Caesar's important papers, including the dictator's last will and testament. Although the liberators had not included him in their plot to kill Caesar, Cicero wholeheartedly supported the action. Caesar was a tyrant. The voice of the Roman people, which had been expressed in their public elections for the past 450 years, had suddenly been replaced by dictatorial appointments to office based on the office holder's support of the dictator, and with no regard for the constitutionality of his decrees. One of the dictator's 44 BC appointments, Decimus Junius Brutus, apart from Caesar's support, was too young to legally hold the praetorship he had been given. Another praetor too young to qualify for his post was Lucius Martius Philippus, the stepbrother of Caesar's heir. And Marcus Antonius's co-consul, Publius Cornelius Dolabella, the one-time son-in-law of Cicero, was far too young to legally stand for consular election. Yet, all these men now held the top offices in government and served at the pleasure of Caesar. For these reasons, Cicero saw the absolute necessity for Caesar's death. And yet, the conspirators had not thought to include the very man who, in his youth, had taken on the corruption of Sulla's dictatorship, and then later, saved his country from the conspiracy of Catalina. Had they invited Cicero into their plans, the father of the Republic would have made certain that the movement had been assisted by the appropriate military and senatorial support to ensure a smooth transition of power back into the hands of the Senate. But instead, the liberators could not see beyond their own hatred of Caesar, naively trusting that the moment the dictator was dead, everything else would simply fall into place. But, as the events on the Ides of March had proven, the legions, the people, and all those who loved Caesar did not suddenly wake up and realize they had been trading freedom for a perceived political advantage. Nor did they worship at the liberators' feet for having opened their eyes. Cicero's many years in politics, serving under dictators, both official and unofficial, would have taught the aged orator just how willingly human eyes remain closed. By March 17, just 48 hours after the murder of Julius Caesar, Rome found herself in the hands of the consul, Marcus Antonius, and Caesar's master of the horse, Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, both staunch members of the Caesarian party. With Lepidus's legion occupying the Forum Romanum and Antonius appropriating the role of executor of Caesar's will, Cicero had no opportunity to leverage Caesar's death to the benefit of the Senate and himself. Instead, all he could do was stitch together an uneasy peace treaty between the Caesarians, who held all the military power, and the liberators, who had the Senate support. But that treaty lasted only three days. Despite Cicero's warnings to the liberators not to agree to a public funeral for Caesar, 
they did not heed his advice, and Marcus Antonius was given the opportunity to so inflame the mob's passions that kill squads combed the city in search of any they could blame for Caesar's murder. After Caesar's funeral, there seemed little hope for Cicero to successfully unseat Marcus Antonius and bring about a restoration of the Republic. Then, on the 25th of March, Caesar's heir, Gaius Octavius, landed in Italy. The young man whom Marcus Antonius claimed had refused his posthumous adoption had in fact made no such claims. Cicero learned this firsthand when Gaius Octavius dropped by one of Cicero's country villas just prior to his April 11th arrival in Rome. And if Cicero had any reason to doubt that Marcus Antonius, a consul of Rome, would tell such a blatant lie to the people, that suspicion would have been quickly dispelled when Antonius rushed Brutus and Cassius out of Rome, procured the office of Pontifex Maximus for Lepidus, and secured election to Brutus's vacant praetorship for his brother, Gaius Antonius, both offices needed by Octavius to lay claim to his posthumous adoption. With Octavius and Antonius at loggerheads, Cicero saw a second opportunity to nudge the Senate back towards its supremacy. Antonius unofficially held control of Caesar's legions, while Octavius unofficially held Caesar's name. So, when Gaius Octavius withdrew from Rome and retreated to his stepfather's villa in Puteoli to seek the support of various senators, it is likely that Cicero encouraged his peers to invest in the young and naive Gaius Octavius, allowing Octavius the necessary funds to entice legions away from Antonius would bring the young and impressionable nineteen-year-old in line with the Senate's agenda. And even though Gaius Octavius was not legally allowed to raise legions, there was no denying that the young heir to Caesar, going up against Marcus Antonius, would require a personal bodyguard for protection from the nearly six thousand veterans Antonius had just legislated for himself. And if Gaius Octavius should unknowingly strengthen the Senate's position, Marcus Antonius's vise-like grip on the state would soon diminish. And when Cicero succeeded in dragging the Senate through the Caesarian party divide and back to its proper preeminence, Gaius Octavius would either fall into line or he would be disposed of. After setting Gaius Octavius and Marcus Antonius on a political collision course which would see them fighting over Caesar's legions, Cicero continued to work behind the scenes on behalf of Brutus and Cassius, both of whom were residing outside the city. One of the duties of the urban praetor was to organize the Ludi Apollinaries, or Games of Apollo, which were held each year from the 6th through the 13th of July. These games featured athletic competitions, foot races, wild animal hunts, and on the final day of the games, chariot races within Rome's Circus Maximus. Marcus Junius Brutus had been relieved of the office of urban praetor, allowing him and Gaius Cassius Longinus the freedom to leave the city rather than face negative public opinion. The Ludi Apollinaries, however, offered Brutus and Cassius, who had no support from the plebs or the legions, the perfect opportunity to change the public's perception. No longer obligated under the statutes of the office, which now belonged to Gaius Antonius, it is probable that Cicero colluded in Brutus's and Cassius's decision to use their personal wealth to sponsor the Ludi Apollinaries as private citizens, hoping that once the plebs were sufficiently entertained with bread and services, they would support the recall of the liberators to the city. Around this same time, both Brutus and Cassius donated lands on which veterans could settle, hoping to secure the support of the same legion Cicero was attempting to split between Marcus Antonius and Gaius Octavius. But Cicero had underestimated Gaius Octavius, who had used the funds loaned to him by senatorial supporters for purposes other than enticing legions away from Marcus Antonius. Between the monies Octavius received from Caesarian supporters who feared Antonius's political agenda, and those raised from the selling off of properties, even at a loss, Gaius Octavius finally acquired sufficient wealth to pay to the Roman people the bequest of seventy-five drachmae per male citizen, left to them by Caesar in his last will and testament. By paying out this bequest before the start of the Ludi Apollinaries, Gaius Octavius managed to undermine the image makeover of Brutus and Cassius. 
In a single move, the young and naive heir of Caesar gained the full support of the Roman plebs who viewed the bestowal not as a legacy from Caesar, but as a benevolent gift from his upright and honorable adopted offspring. Despite Cicero's behind-the-scenes attempts to rebuild the reputations of Brutus, Cassius, and the rest of the liberators scattered throughout the empire, the still unofficial son of Caesar had suddenly gained a power base, all his own.